just setting up now. Hello, everyone. For anyone tuning in right at the start, we'll get started in just a second, letting a few more people get onto the session here. Um, if you are tuning in right away, feel free to say hi, where you're from, and if you're a member of American Ancestors in the comment section. Uh, we love to hear from you and who's who's out there tuning in. We'll give it just another another second to have some more folks tune in before we get started. All right, and for folks just uh, joining us, feel free to put in the comment section uh, where you're tuning in from. If you're a member of American Ancestors, um, we want to be this to be as interactive as possible. All right, so we're just at about three o'clock Eastern time now, so let's get started. Um, welcome to our most recent installment of Facebook Live. Um, this time we'll be discussing uh, journals and periodicals found on our website, AmericanAncestors.org. Um, my name is Trisha Labby. I'm an events manager here at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. So I work mainly behind the scenes on the logistics of our many programs. I'll be moderating today's event. American Ancestors and NEHGS is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors like many of you in the audience today. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and we're pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world, especially at this time when we still can't quite be in person together as a group. Our speaker today is Don LeClaire. Don is our uh, Associate Director of Database Search and Systems on our web team. Don joined the American Ancestors web team in 2016 to help manage the applications and processes that support our online database collections. So um, all those collections that you use on our website from home. He first got involved with genealogy while in college and spent many a day in the NEHGS library tracing his own ancestors through New England and New York. Um, Don also did a lot of volunteer indexing work um, for the library before joining the staff. Um, so Don will lead today's presentation on searching journals and periodicals on our website. Um, he'll highlight these important genealogical publications, how you can access them from home and more. Um, and after his presentation, we'll have some time for questions from the audience. Um, so if you think of anything during his presentation, please type it into the comment section on Facebook at any time. And we'll get to as many as we can after the presentation. Um, before I pass it over to Don, a couple quick reminders. Um, this presentation will be recorded and can be found um, on our Facebook page under the event or on our YouTube page um, after the live broadcast. We'll post it there for you. Um, if you're unable to attend this whole presentation live or if anyone experiences any technical difficulties out there, you won't miss any content and you can watch that recording on your own time. Um, so without further ado, I will pass it over to Don to get started. Thanks very much, Tricia, and welcome everyone. Uh, very happy you could all join us this afternoon to talk about searching journals on American ancestors. So what I'd like to do is actually start off by talking about when we say searching journals, what set of databases are we talking about? So if you were to go to the American ancestors homepage and look under the search menu, um, you can go to browse databases A to Z, which gives you initially a list of all of the databases. As of today, there's 478 databases online. But you can see down this, uh, we can do a search for an individual database based on name or part of its description. But we also have filters on the left. And then if you scroll down through the filters, we start off with locations and then date ranges, and then we have categories. So one of those particular categories is journals and periodicals. And those numbers that you see on the left uh, that are in uh, in parentheses there are the number of databases in any one of these categories or based on these filters. So if I click on journals and periodicals, then I will see the list of currently there's 23 databases in this category. 
and it is databases and periodicals. So you can see that there are journals, American Ancestors, the Connecticut Nutmegger, uh, Mayflower Descendant. There are also uh, things that are extracts from, uh, typically from periodicals. So you, those will have date ranges on them typically. So you can see the Boston Evening Transcript genealogy pages from 1911 to 1940. So, but, but those are the set of things that are, you, you'll find in this category. And one, I think the, one, the, the biggest value of using the, at least the scholarly journal side of this is that they are indeed scholarly journals. They're, these are um, articles that have typically been peer reviewed, they're edited, they're done by people who are leaders in their field. And so it's a really fabulous way to leverage what the research they've done to help you do your own family history research and, and build out your own tree. So in the list, we show uh, essentially a table of the things that match your current search criteria. And basically, key things to note is this, there's a magnifying glass by each one that tells you, if you click on that, that, that will go to search that particular database. Um, there's an icon of a camera or a piece of paper with a folded page that tells you, does this database have images with it, or is it an index only one? So most, certainly all of the scholarly journals have their uh, actual pages of the journals in them. Um, there's a star you can use for setting favorites, and then the name you can click on to go to the link. So in this category, in the journals we actually have, aside from these 23 databases, that translates into um, 320,000 pages of uh, journals that have been digitized and put online, and they contain roughly 5.8 million searchable names. So it's really one of the areas of strengths in our databases online. Uh, virtually all of these databases are not available um, anywhere else. Uh, so it's great to have them online and be able to share them with you. Um, and we do add journals as time goes by. So a couple of the ones that we added last year, you could see one is Vermont Genealogy, which covers um, the years 1996 through 2014. Um, and by the way, we um, typically have an arrangement with the publishers that we wait five years, occasionally at six years, uh, but uh, before we can publish them online. Um, these many of these organizations uh, sell reprints for a few years, so we have an arrangement so that uh, once it's, once an issue or a volume has been out for more than five years, then we can go ahead and, and index it. So we'll go through and period periodically update them with new volumes pretty much on an annual basis. So Vermont Genealogy came last year in, in March, and then it's not a new uh, publication, but the Genealogical Advertiser, which actually ran um, from the years 1898 to 1901, was one that we put online uh, later last year. So we'll talk more about this, but it's an area where we, we continue to make investments, and both in terms of adding new volumes from existing uh, publications, as well as recruiting and, and searching for new sources to add to this category of databases. Well, one other thing I should point out is that um, one of the questions we often get, I'm sure some of you are not uh, uh, full members of American Ancestors, you what we call guest members. So one of the other things you can do is you can click on the only free databases, and that will tell you that there are a couple of these publications that are available for free, meaning if you create a guest member account for which you only have to provide an email address, there's no cost, no credit card, nothing goes on file. Uh, those are the ones that you can access, uh, or you can access the set of things. Um, as a guest member, and the other the other databases we'll be talking about uh, will then be require a uh, contributing uh, membership type. But one other thing that's that uh, I guess sort of like a uh, secret menu type item we, as I said, you can search for all or part of a name, but you can also search for keywords. And if you look at some of the database descriptions, you can find interesting keywords. So one of those is AA unique, meaning is this database unique to American ancestors? And sure enough, you can see there's 223 databases in total uh, across all of our various collections that would fall under that uh, unique category. So it's something that can help you. Uh, uh, sometimes databases are, po are posted on multiple sites, but those ones that say AA unique are only on American ancestors. So let's, let's switch to an example. So what I would like to do uh, as we talk today is go through a few different examples and, and present some challenges or how you might want to do searching and looking up uh, information in, uh, in the scholarly journals that are available on American ancestors. So one of those here, I've brought up a page. Um, this is from the 
um, Mayflower family's fifth generation descendants. So we have an online database, not related to journals, but it is um, the fifth generation and their children out of the silver books that we have an arrangement with the General Society of Mayflower descendants to create a database out of that. So if we're here, we're looking at information about a descendant of Peter Brown. And um, we can see in the page here that there are references to this uh, family, <clears throat> and specifically around uh, David Mahoran. If I mispronounced that, I apologize. <laughs> I don't know the proper pronunciation. But if we look at these references, we can see here that there's a reference to the NEHGR uh, volume 136 page 124 and then additionally pages 115 to 7. So this is a good example where you want to look something up from uh, the register somewhere along the line and uh, it's good to be able to just go directly to a page. You want to go you prefer to not have to go back and issue a whole search to figure out where that person got the reference. So let me show you how you'd go about doing that. So basically, if you if you go to the database list A to Z, we could search for the register or, or filter um, using the uh, journals. We also, given that many people abbreviate the publication as NEHGR, as we just saw in that example, we've made that one of the keywords. And uh, a sort of brief aside before we go into the, the looking up the specific references, that oddly enough, this comes back with two databases, the register itself, and another database called Vital Records from the New England Historical and Genealogical Register. And the difference is the the uh, regularly indexed and updated version of the register is uh, searchable by first and last name, and we'll get into more details about this, but they don't include years of events. So we have a very long running project that's been going on to extract the data from 175 years of publication of the register and put in birth, marriage, death, residence, other types of records and make those searchable with appropriate context uh, with both dates, if they're available, family locations and, and that sort of a thing. So that, today's focus will not go into this database. We're gonna, we're gonna focus on the journals, but if you are a member and interested in looking for some of this is that some of the, some of the information is available. So this could be another way to uh, get some value out of the register. So what I do when I look at the register itself, now I want to go back to find that particular page, uh, volume 136.24. I can click that camera, which will go directly to the images. So I'm not doing a search per se. I'm going to the register, and I'm going to now I can see page one of volume one from 1847. So you have the ability to navigate directly just using the this information in the top line. So the the volume I'm looking for is volume 136. So I can do the pull down under volumes. I can slide down to uh, volume 136. Click on that. I need to wait a second until it gets to that page. And then I can go type in the page number. So the page in that reference that we just saw a moment ago was page 24. I can just type 24 in the page number. And now I am in the register, or almost in the register. Now I'm in the register looking at a particular article from that um, that particular issue. And you can see here that it's talking about that family. And down at the bottom of the page, there is our David that we were just reading about uh, previously. So, so as a reference to this page, we can see here is the reference to his birth and the information about his parents. Now, the reference that we saw a moment ago, if I go back to it for a second, said also said, see pages 115-7, meaning 115 to 117. So I can um, just type another page number in here. It's the same volume and uh, hit enter. And now I will go to page 115. And now we can see this is a continuation of that article. And this is now the, the descendant report about David himself. So that was the person that we were reading about and the others we can see all of that information. Um, now that, that reference included uh, a page, a set of pages that you can go through. So this is 115. If you haven't tried it before, the arrows on either side of the page number are uh, clickable. So if I want to go to page 116, I can just click the, the character to the right and now I can browse through this entire article or any article this works with actually every database but it's particularly helpful with the um, the journals and peri periodicals because you're looking essentially at a magazine or a journal and you want to be able to click through the pages just as if you had a hard copy in your hand you can read through it it's not like a uh, a uh, birth register or something else where all the information is on the page you're looking at so this is a, a pretty common a way of 
coming in with a reference from another uh, location. So you can use this same approach with any of the databases that show that we have in the, the journals and periodicals. So we have uh, the American genealogist, we have um, the Virginia genealogy, we have a variety of different journals. And, and if you have a reference for one of those, you can use this technique to go do a lookup and find that. In cases where you don't already have a reference, then you want to go off and do your own searching. So we're going to, I'm going to show you three different uh, approaches for doing search um, for um, this collection of journals and periodicals. So the first one I'll show is what we call category search. And um, you can find that if you, um, you look at the, the search menu, Below advanced search, we have actually all of these categories have a there's a category specific search page. So the one we just picked for the one that we already have here, had here, here we go, is the journals and periodicals search. So um, for journals and periodicals, the way we have done the indexing on these is essentially we've taken uh, the information from the index at the back of the volume uh, of basically the first name and the last name and, and created an index from that, along with a couple of other pieces of information. One of those is the article title where they're available. We have article titles associated. Uh, so you, if you're looking at an article, you can restrict your range by article title. And then we have the year. But the really important thing to know when you're talking about journals is that the year is not the year of an event like a birth, a marriage, a death. It's the year that the article was published. So when we, in the description here, we talk about the years are the publication years. Just keep that in mind. Uh, most of these publications are uh, 18, you start at the earliest in the 1800s. So if you put in a date in, 19, in the uh, 1700s, you're not going to get very many results because there weren't any journals then. So what I'll just do is I'm going to do a search here for Mary. Poffenberger. And so it's just simple. I'm just going to do the name search. We'll talk about some of the things with article titles uh, in a little bit. Um, oh, but before I do search, I'm, I apologize. I should point out a couple of other things. So we do have below the search form, we have tips for searching this category. So it gives you uh, a variety of sort of instructions for what you can do in search, including if you're inclined to use things like wildcard characters, it explains how to use wildcard characters in the name fields. Um, we also will have a couple of sample images and some descriptive information about uh, this category. So that is available on the search page if you were to page down before it. And also on the right hand side, you got you can you if you want to switch to a different category, we have the links to the other categories that are available and you can just click over to one of those and uh, do searches from there. But in this case, I'm just going to go back and now execute that search I just typed in of, for Mary Poffenberger. And so this comes back and this now will show you um, the things that match and we have um, a stunningly large number of records <laughs> and that's because uh, on the when we're doing the category search and i'll highlight this again in a moment um, we give you what we call a best fit solution meaning that we'll take whatever terms you've put in and will any any record that matches any part of your terminology the terms that you put in will give you return to you but they'll be sorted in a relevant sequence meaning the ones that are the best fit to your search will get shown first this is essentially what happens in google like if you're doing google search if you put in multiple words the things that match best show up at the top of the list and the things that are not very good matches will show up on page two or three or page 500 or depending how far you will are willing to go down so what we do is, so I'd search for Mary Poffenberger, is we have a set of items that were a close match. Now they all happen to be in the Virginia genealogist. So just pointing out that our databases do extend beyond New England uh, in the journals. We have Virginia genealogists and also the Pennsylvania genealogist. Um, the, as I mentioned before, the year of the record is, uh, and it's 1999. I mean, this is the year it was published. It looks like we uh, a couple of these are earlier earlier in 1991, um, and we're listing then the title of the database it's in and journals and periodicals. Below the blue line are things that matched on part of your terms. So here we see there's other Poffenbergers available uh, in the in the publication list. So you can scroll down through those if you're so inclined. Um, but this is something that we've done in, in our category search and database search, which we'll talk about in a moment, to try to be more flexible and give you um, potentially uh, more results than you look for, but make sure the best ones are up front, as opposed to coming back and doing a search and not getting any results, which is something we, we kind of like to avoid when we can.
Um, and like with the uh, some of the other, we have filters on the left, so you can then uh, filter the results that come come to a specific publication. Uh, so there's a variety of things you can do, but this is uh, the basic uh, pieces for. Um, how you do search. Now you have two choices. You can click on the name. The name uh, will bring up what we call the record display page, which will show you essentially recap the information that's captured in that record. Given that that's mostly the same as what we're seeing here, you can go directly to the page image by clicking on view image. So now I'm in looking at this particular page from the Virginia genealogist. And I can see down here about the middle of the page, we have Mary Poffenberger shows up in this particular page. But I also want to point out if you, in any of these cases, when you when you get your results, when you're looking at the results in the context of any given database, if you look below the image, you can see that we have citation information. So we have the name of the database and when it was published, we have a hyperlink in here, we have uh, the description that comes with that database, and then we'll have uh, search tips are repeated here. So, so all of that thing, all of the information that might be available on a database search page or elsewhere is just repeated underneath the image to help you uh, sort of get that context or see what other things you might be interested in trying once you've uh, found one of these results. So that's that's the category search. Now, database search is remarkably similar, <laughs> except that it's for a given database. So you you come to database search. So we went back here when we were looking at um, American Ancestors magazine. If I clicked on this, then this would take me over to the uh, database search page, which is now this one has the fields that are available for this particular database. So. Over time, we've been uh, indexing and, and creating databases since the late 1990s. So not every database has the exact set, set of same fields that are available. Uh, the journals are remarkably similar in terms of what they have, but we do offer this database specific search. It looks remarkably like category search because the main fields are the first and last name, years and keywords. I would promised to come back and talk about keywords before, so here we are. So the keywords, uh, as described here in the search tips, are where we put have indexed the article titles. So if I come to American Ancestors Magazine, which has uh, been published for um, about since 2010, as I recall, uh, it has a variety of articles. Uh, it has interesting things on. There's a recurring article on doing uh, research in Upper New York State, or in, excuse me, in New York State, which if you have ancestors there. I'm sure you could use chips and techniques to try to do that as well. Um, but any title that's there. One of the other nice things that they have, aside from being a beautiful publication, is there's a lot of content around DNA. So if you would like to take advantage of looking for some of that content, you don't have to put anything in the name field or the years. You can just say, I want to see all the articles that have DNA in them. And when I click search, we'll get those in a moment. Um, so if I do that, which I will now, we can see then we may have the blue line up here because there was no name in the search, <laughs> but you can see we have a number of articles here uh, about DNA discoveries, uh, chasing uh, a family through DNA research, and there happens to be one here on uh, Mayflower connections. So I can now click on the view image button and I can see an article. In this case, it was an article written by Christopher Childs or Chris Childs, who works for NHGS, um, who uh, is a one of our leaders in the area of DNA based research and he's uh, provided this interesting article about uh, making connection Mayflower type connections through DNA and I hear I'm at the beginning of the article as I said before you can use the carrots to click through it this particular article has an interesting particularly interesting table in it and that you can see here we have information about the passengers and spouses and then what info it tells you ideas on what kind of information is available in in hetero haplo groups from the ye dna and the mitochondrial dna which may be assistance to you if you're starting to use dna in your family history research so that's the database search and then the last piece um, is advanced search. Now the difference between advanced search and database search is also stated here in that advanced search is our original search form. It search it can, but in fact, by default, it will search across all databases, but it will 
be pretty restrictive and meaning that we will only return results that match all of your criteria. So if you put in something in here for which we don't have a record, then you can get no records returned. Um, we haven't changed that just because uh, this is the way a lot of people are used to using American ancestors. So we have category search and database search, which have that best fit algorithm. And then advanced search does what we call a must fit algorithm. So, uh, but you can, from advanced search, you can um, also pick a category. So you have here, I've picked the category journals and periodicals. I could pick an individual database if I wanted to do that. In this case, I won't. So here, I'm going to look for Anna Snow between 1742 and 1807 when she listed. And I'm doing, and I click search, and then I'm going to get this, which no one really likes to see this. This is as there's no results. By the way, if you do get this, there are, inform there is, this is not, just blank text, there are actually some specific suggestions uh, that, that to your query that might help you to modify your criteria. So you can go back and then do a refine, hit the refine button and modify your query. And so as I, I warned you earlier, if you do searches in 1742 to early 1800, you're not likely to get any journal uh, hits there. But maybe I'm interested in checking something in the last four years. So in the case of um, Maybe you've done research in some of these journals in the past, and you want to come back, and I just want to look for any, any research over the last four years. Now I can put in publication years and do search, and then now it will come back with, actually it turns out there's a relatively recent a one year old article from the Mayflower descendant about my person I'm searching here for here, which is Anna Snow. So, so unlike we were seeing in database search and category search, there's not a, typically a long list of things. Maybe if you were searching for John Smith, you would have a long list, but you're going to get a, typically you'll get a shorter uh, list of ca uh, candidate results for you to browse through. So I, I think I mentioned the five-year cutoff. Um, in the case of the uh, Mayflower Descendant uh, magazine, that was uh, independently published pro uh, previously, but uh, we have now taken over as publisher of this. So um, Mayflower Descendant is published by NEHGS. And given that this is uh, um, one of our own publications, we've modified that. So we now actually post all of the issues uh, once that once the year has been completed, we add it to our online databases. So, so unlike some cases, we had to wait five years and happily in the case of um, Mayflower Descendant, we can do anything pretty much uh, up till the end of the year. And the, the Mayflower Descendant completes its last issue right around the end of the year. So we usually have those um, early the year after. So this was added in 2021. And here I can see, here's my, my reference to the, the search of uh, NS Snow. So that's you know pretty ordinary search. A couple of things I would like to highlight is one is the citation information. So we talked about, I mentioned this before, and there are two things um, we can um, show you here. So you can uh, copy and paste um, the citation just by using the using your browser and do a copy. Um, and you can also do use the copy citation button. So if I click copy citation, that will automatically copy that for you. Um, right at the moment, if you're using the Edge browser, uh, it does not do that because they don't, at least uh, as of a year ago, they didn't allow you to uh, write to the system uh, clipboard uh, directly. But if you're using uh, Chrome or Firefox or Safari, it will work fine. But even if it doesn't, you can always you can always do the highlight. If you're using Edge, you can always do the highlight and copy that way. So this can be very handy uh, if you're creating a document uh, and putting it in Word or you're uh, want to cut and paste this reference into your family tree of whatever family tree software you're using that you can take to get the extracted information very conveniently right below the place where you would find um, the image. One other thing I would point out is um, there's a, um, a site we call a citation URL as part of this description. So if you were to save off this URL, this will take you back exactly to this page in the future. Um, and while it's not a short URL, this one is about 60 some odd characters. The default, the standard URL, if you just copy the URL from your browser can be upwards to 117, 120 characters. So it's a somewhat compacted URL. Um, a number of people that we've worked with do uh, write articles or write uh, blogs or something else. And, and a, a really long URL can be uh, intimidating or really unfortunate to look at if you're looking at a printed document. So a lot of people like to use the shorter citation URL to copy the information and put it into whatever they're, they're writing about or want to use. 
Okay. Um, let me switch over. I can show you something else. So that gives you, I think we've never covered all of the searches. We've covered um, uh, category search, database search, advanced uh, citations. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, uh, printing page ranges. So here's, I'm going to switch over to a different article in the Mayflower Descendant. This one is one written by Nathaniel Lane Taylor, who, uh, what, also being a writer, happens to be the editor and publisher of the American Genealogist. So uh, there's a lot of people, a lot of thing, people work in uh, across multiple journals, and here's one of those cases where he's written an article published in the Mayflower Descendant. It's also, this particular article is exactly the kind of thing that I think highlights one of the real, the real values of these scholarly journals, in that this is the case where a gentleman by the name of Simeon Nye had a wife, Alice, but there's um, a couple of Alice's in the area that uh, may ha both have a, a good case for being his wife. And this goes through an in-depth uh, coverage of uh, this family and uh, helps you come to the proper conclusion on who's, which Alice was the one who married uh, Simeon. Um, so this might be something that you find it and say this, I'd like to read this later. So, or, or y'all want to save it off and, and share, share it with a friend or, or something like that. So one of the things you can do is if you look at this article, I, like, I, I could go download each page of this individually. If you haven't done it before, you could either do a print or download. If you do download, it downloads the image that you're currently looking at. But I'm going to show you, talk about print range uh, in a moment or as, as we go. So I have this article. It starts here on page 22. I can click through this to see how long this article is and I can click to the end. So it's only a five page article. Um, it's all right there, it's contiguous. So if I do print range, I can just say, I'm starting at page 22. I do have to be on the, the beginning of the page I wanna do in the print range. And then I can fill in uh, the number of pages I want. So I can put in five here and say print. And it'll take a few seconds to come back because it's going off and it's getting all of the pages. Um, it, builds them up and then you have an option if you submitting on all the browsers today have a, a save as PDF option so you can indeed print it off to a printer I could print this to a printer or I could save it as a PDF and then basically when I say save it creates the PDF and then if I I'll open up the PDF I've already saved this one I just I'll save the trouble of uh, have you go through uh, filing it and saving it. And then here is my article, uh, all five pages. And, and a couple of things that we provide for you along with the, the actual page images is here in the header, uh, you see, here's the publication, the page number it was on and the volume number it was found in. Then you have the article and then below the article, we actually repeat the citation information. So all of that information that came um, associated with that, you know, below the page, the information with the description of the database and citation is available to you inside the PDF uh, when you download that. So I think printing as a PDF is, is incredibly useful for um, articles in journals. Um, typically, you're not looking for just one page. You want to get an entire article, so you have context for uh, saving this away in your folders. I know I've... Uh, Took me a while, but I, to get off of saving hard copy for things, I've been trying to convert everything, all my reference information into PDFs so I can find them again later. Um, so being able to automatically save them off as PDFs is, I think, a very useful capability. But it extends to other types of databases too. Um, one of the other categories of databases that we have uh, quite a few of are um, probate file papers for Massachusetts. Similar kind of situation with probate file papers where you have uh, a case that might be two pages, it could be 500 pages long. You could go through, use a tool like this to extract a probate file, save that off as a PDF. So I know we had a lot of people that were very happy when we first introduced it. And so I always like to promote this as uh, make sure people are aware because I don't, I'm not aware of this kind of capability being available on uh, most of the other sites uh, for doing um, genealogical research. So let's, I want to go back and uh, talk about another uh, challenge. So we talked about how we do indexing for, for um, these journals and that it's a first and last name index. Um, and if you have a common name, it, it would be really nice if you could be able to specify a location for it. Uh, as I said, we don't have, because the um, information is the first and last name, we don't actually have a location or an event date. But oftentimes, it's not always, but often you can find that the articles will have a location as part of the title. 
So let's say I have an interest in um, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And so I can go off and I, and I think I'm going to look, I would like to look at the American genealogist. So I can go to advanced search and select the database of American genealogist. I can put in the keywords uh, uh, value, just Lancaster. I want to get any article that references Lancaster no matter where it is. And that's, it's, it's a good idea to have as few terms as possible because as we'll see, people don't use consistent abbreviations. This is part of an article title. I check that, I don't have to put any name and I can go in and do a search. And I can look in the American Genealogist, and sure enough, I have a number of records. Uh, the first one happens to be for Lancaster, Massachusetts, but I also see Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, uh, and you can see it appears in Virginia, but there are several instances here of Lancasters. So this can be a technique to try. If you're looking for a certain article or, or a certain family, you can, you can include potentially a town or a state in your, into the um, article title search to see if that'll help you narrow the results where you might otherwise get a lot of people um, included in here. And these article titles, I didn't mention before, but they, if I go to the image, it does take you to the first page of the article. So you don't land in the middle of an article like you might if you were searching for a name, this will just take you to the very beginning. And here we're seeing uh, John Bowers of, of Lancaster, Massachusetts. So I would say, um, it's a good thing to experiment with, or and uh, but you can also use it. For example, if you if you're looking at an article and you see someone that you're interested in, then um, you might be able to go back and repeat your query to get all the people that are referenced in that article, or look for other family names in the article without having to read through the whole thing itself. And you can do that by flipping over to the transcript view here. And what the transcript view does is tells you what are all the names that are captured on that page. So if I see some of these, I see, oh, some Millers are in there. I wanted to look for any other Millers. I can go back, change my, my, go back to the search results and then go back and change this. So I could put in a last name of Miller in there and see if there's any other Millers references in, in Lancaster, in this case, Lancaster, Massachusetts. Good. So the next thing is uh, one of the, the delightful aspects of doing searches in journals is that uh, it's a common practice to take a lot, what would be a very long article and split it up over multiple issues and maybe even multiple places within the same issue. And in which case then, if you'd like to go back and find the beginning of the article, that can be a challenge. In this particular case, I'm looking at an example where I've, I've done a, a search. I was looking for Horace Kellogg and sure enough, I find some death information from him in a cemetery in uh, Holland in Connecticut. And, uh, but I'd like to find out more about this article. This one was um, in a very friendly way. We've copied the information about the author uh, of the article into the heading on the continuation. I can assure you that is not always the practice. Oftentimes the title is there. And if you wanted to find out who wrote it, you want to get an author's name, you'd have to go back to the beginning. So in this particular case, I happened to have stumbled across, excuse me, stumbled upon an entry for Horace. Um, he is appearing here on page 130, or excuse me, an article that's continued from 131. So I'm on currently on page 204. So if I want to go back to page 131, I can do that. <laughs> And then I'll see that it's uh, here's this is the it says to be continued. So this is where I picked up from. But if I go back, I can see this this goes for quite some time. So I'm not sure how far it goes back. So how can I go about um, doing a search to find the beginning of this article? So oops. So what we would do in this case is I would go to. Um, Searching. Sorry, let me just I will start a new search. <clears throat> so I'll go and I'm going to search the register. And I'm going to go back and look for kind of the keyword of Connecticut. I believe it was, make sure I get it right. Sorry. One second. Can we get cemetery inscriptions? Thank you. And I want to just check the article title. So I'm going to say, just give me all the article, all the article titles uh, from the register that start that have that in them. And then I find out that I've hit the jackpot. <laughs> this this uh, particular article, there are 23 hits. Um, 
meaning that it's been split out into 23 different installments. Now, as I said, our default sort is relevance order. This is almost always the best way to go. But in, but in this particular case, I'm looking for the start. So I want to find out when was the first one. So I can do change the sort to say, the, I want to find the oldest to the most recent. And so then I do the update. And now I'll come back and I'll see that this article started in 1912 and continues through 1913 and 14 and 15 and so on. But if I want to go back and see the beginning of this article, now I can click on this image and uh, click the image button to go view the beginning of the article. And this will now take me over to eventually. <laughs> it will take me over to the beginning of that article. There we go. And so here we see, here's the, who's the author uh, or the person who copied transcript. It was Joel Eno of Hartford Cemetery. But I've been able to find that much more easily than I was, I believe, eight or nine volumes into this. I would have had to go back, sort of paging back through this article to go find it. So this is probably the single best way of, of if you run into an article that is split over multiple um, issues to use this uh, use the search for the article title, you know, copy those words in, and then you'll be able to find them very quickly. All right, I'll have one other scenario I want to talk to you, talk to you about. Um, this is one specific to the register. And um, so I've done a search here for uh, Joanna Lund, and I found a set of examples. So if I go click on view image, and I actually had uh, this interesting image will come up. It says, this page is not available. <laughs> So actually I had one of these uh, 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 call this morning or email this morning from webmaster. So what happened is, as I said, the register has been being published since 1847. Um, when we took contributions or people who wrote articles for the, the register in uh, up till the uh, around 2000, they didn't anticipate that they would be giving us rights to put their article online. The rights were restricted to printed, being printed in the, the register itself. So before we put this database online, we went through a long effort to get releases from the from all the copyright holders. And in approximately two dozen cases, there's an, art, there's an article where we did not get that permission from the copyright holder. So when that happens, you'll see this page says it's not available because we don't have permission to display it. Uh, but if you're a member of any HGS, then you have uh, part of your membership entitles you to access to all the articles of the register. So if you email us at webmaster at nehgs.org, then we can send you a copy of that article. We'll just send you a PDF of the entire article. And so we can take care of it that way. So it only if this one currently is only an issue with the register. As I said it's only about two dozen. But they do seem to be popular articles. So we probably get um, you know a couple of these a month where someone runs into this. So if you see it, don't panic. Just send us an email and we're happy to help you out. Which I guess is a good point to talk for a moment just about contacting us. So you can just cut, copy, and paste the, the or you can't actually copy and paste this is an image. You can type webmaster at nehgs.org into your uh, email tool of choice and send us a note and let us know what volume and page you were looking for. We'll get it to you. There's two other ways to contact a webmaster. We, we try to make it as easy as possible. So the first one is above the image display screen or almost all of the record detail screens, there's a button that says report error. So if you click this button, um, you can, it doesn't really matter if you fill in the error correction or question comment, but you can, you can say you want to report something to us. If you're logged in, we'll default to your email address that you've logged in with. It's already pre-populated and you can just, um, uh, type in a note to us, you know, this is great. Most likely you won't say this is great. <laughs> you have a question, but you would come in and say, or, or, or in this page, I'd say, please send this article. So that is an excellent uh, way to, to get the article back because what happens is when you submit this request, when the email comes in to us and, and either myself or Molly Rogers typically are answering these, um, we get a note with the URL of the page you're looking at. So if I send this, if I submit this, it behind the scenes, it generates an email to us. And then in the next business day, we'll get back to you uh, to answer your question. So if you're looking at any of these screens and say, see the report error button, you can use that. And we also have an option on some of the other screens. There's a comment or question box. This does essentially the same thing, but some people just respond differently to these. So we provide both mechanisms. So I could also start typing in here and I can say, please send. Um, 
and then, as I said, just as with the other one, my email address is, is filled in. If for some reason, like you have multiple email addresses, you'd like it to come to a different one, you can you can uh, change that, um, and then just do a send. Uh, so those are the two the two ways. It, really, the best way is to send us notes at, at Webmaster because when when you send us uh, using this facility, we get essentially URL back to the page you're looking at. So if you happen to be off on a, I don't know, I have to an example, or if you've done a database search, so you've got a query standing there, or, uh, then you send this report error, we get the same link, we can see exactly what you're seeing, and then it may, we guess we're able to help you much more quickly that way. Um, if there's a problem or it's not working for you, then feel free to send us any kind of email at a webmaster, we're always happy to take questions. So those are the, the main scenarios I wanted to go through today is we uh, sort of a sneak peek on things that are coming. Um, as I said, we are looking to add new journals. Uh, we are in discussions even now with several uh, different things, but there is one that's that's coming close. So the next one that will be coming out is uh, a journal called the Narragansett Historical Register. This is, um, for those of you that are not uh, New Englanders, you might not, Narragansett is uh, Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island. So the Narragansett Historical Register uh, was published from 1882 to 1891, and it's devoted to antiquities, genealogy, and other historical matter uh, from Narragansett County, uh, which is the southern part of Rhode Island. So that one, uh, we're just getting that fixed, finished up now. It'll probably be out uh, before the end of the summer. It'll be available as a new searchable database. So um, we're looking forward to that. And, and uh, if you're interested in, in following things that are coming out, we have a blog that is called dbnews.americanancestors.org. And this is a a uh, blog for every database update that we do. As soon as it's available, we put it up on the DB News blog. So when that Narragansett Historical Register comes out, there will be an announcement for it. But anything that we do, um, so there's probably three or four, or two or three announcements a week that come out from updates to various databases, they'll show up on DB News. So you can access this, you can just go to the website through dbnews.americanancestors.org. If you would like, uh, if you're regularly uh, using American ancestors and doing searches, then you can you can optionally subscribe by putting in your email address, and then you'll get a, an email notification whenever we put a new entry on this blog uh, saying that we posted a new database. And if you're not sure and you want to search for something that's already been posted, there is a search capability, so I can go in and search for anything. I want to know when was the uh, you know the last Mayflower descendant uh, issue post. I could do a search on Mayflower Descent and I'd be able to find it quite quickly by doing the search this site. So I will thank you uh, for your attention and uh, support today. And maybe we can see if we've been getting some questions uh, during the course of our discussions today. Great. Thank you, Don. Um, great job. And thank you so much for walking us through so many of our digitized journals and periodicals. Um, they're really a wealth of information. And you also gave us a lot of great tips on um, getting good results while searching them. Um, so to start off with a couple questions we had, um, I know you mentioned this at sort of the beginning of the talk, but for anyone who's maybe just tuning in or came in a little late, um, one of the most common questions we get here at American Ancestors is what makes us unique and what collections we have um, that are unique just to our organization. I was wondering if you could show again um, the way to filter that in our databases, um, just so you people can see um, a specific list of um, what we have on our website that is unique to us. Sure. So we have, as I said, in the search field, we can search for anything that's in the article title or um, the description of a database. But we also have some keywords that you would actually see them in the uh, description of the database. So if, uh, the keyword, uh, our secret keyword is AA unique. If you spell it right, it works better. And if I click AA unique, then this will give me a list of all the databases that are unique to American ancestors. And if you just want to see, um, how, how we capture that is if you're looking for other keywords that if you go down in the database description, you can see here are the keywords. So I search for a unique. Uh, so if you want to see other keywords that have been added, one that's popular is if you're using American Ancestries, then we can provide hints, and, but it's not for every database. This will tell you if we do hinting from any one of our databases, an example. 
Great. That's that's great to see that it's sort of included down there. Um, and I know that's uh, that secret one, AA unique, is something that I learned when we were going through this presentation. Uh, thought it was a, a good tip to remind folks of. Um, so another question um, for any folks out there in the audience who may be motivated or interested in writing for one of our own periodicals, so um, like the Register or American Ancestors magazine, uh, could you share where they might find submission info? And I know we have guidelines for each publication. Sure. Yeah, so if you go under the news heading uh, on American Ancestors, we have our publications. So the Register itself, American Ancestors magazine, Mayflower Descendant. If, for example, for American Ancestors magazine, you were interested in contributing an article, you think you've done something that could be of interest we're happy to support that that we actually the, the link for contribute will take you to a pdf that gives you information of what's the articles we'd like to have what kind of format do we want what's the process that's all available in that contribute link uh, on american ancestors and similarly if we were look at the register wait for it there we go uh, if you go to the register and go to submission guidelines you have the same kind of information so uh what are the kinds of kinds of articles we want we're writing guidelines so we like to encourage people to participate and yes we'd be happy to have uh, any of you that uh, are working articles to contribute to our publications that would be wonderful Great. All right. Well, that um, wraps up about all the time we have and what I'm seeing in the comment section on Facebook. Um, feel free to put any other comments or questions in there. Um, and our staff is continually checking Facebook for um, any follow up and uh, advice that we can give you out there. Um, I want to thank everyone for tuning in, especially on this summer Friday. Um, you know, thank you again to Don for his presentation. Um, I, I do have to say that after maybe a little over five years at American Ancestors, um, and presenting so many times for our education and programming department. Don will be retiring soon. And I think this marks his final presentation for our team. So a huge thank you to Don, um, you know, for walking through uh, not just the group today, but countless members and patrons over the years. Um, and for lending your database search genealogical expertise to all of our programs. Um, Thank you again. Thank you. For yeah, thanks, Don. Um, and uh, again, before you leave the event, um, leave any comments or questions in that uh, Facebook comment section. We'll be checking there. Um, a reminder that this will be recorded if you want to go back and look at anything and reference things as you're doing research on our website. Um, as we continue to expand our Facebook offerings, all feedback is really appreciated. Um, I do want to plug our next Facebook Live event, um, which will be with Claire Vale, our Vice President of Digital Strategy and Communications. And keeping with um, demoing parts of our website, Claire will discuss um, our tree family tree platform, American Ancestry Trees, um, a, a relatively new feature on our website. Um, and she is the expert here on that. I hope you'll all join us um, back here on Facebook on Friday, July 16th, um, same time, 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Eastern time for that topic. Um, and if you are interested in engaging with us more on social media, we do have a Twitter chat every Tuesday afternoon. Um, the next Twitter chat um, is June 22nd and we'll focus on researching Acadian ancestors um, as a precursor to our three week Acadian course that's coming up in July. Um, that will be held on Twitter um, again Tuesday, June 22nd, and that's four to five Eastern time. So come chat with us. Um, you can also follow our hashtag, hashtag our ancestors um, to keep up with that chat. Um, and finally, for our, my last plug, we also have another um, upcoming free webinar on Thursday, July 8th, 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock Eastern Time. We'll have another installment of our quarterly What's New at AmericanAncestors.org. So again, another member of our web team, Molly Rogers, who Don mentioned, um, she'll take us through um, what's new on our website. It's a great way to um, keep up to date with new databases, search features, any resources that we add to our website. Website. Um, you can register online for that and join us July 8th. 
Um, and of course, visit our website to access um, information about programs that I just mentioned or other um, programs and resources in our Brew Family Learning Center online. That's AmericanAncestors.org slash education. Um, we'll sign off for now. I want uh, to thank everyone again, and I hope that you uh, stay healthy and have a great weekend. We hope to see you um, at our online programs again in the future. Goodbye for now.